Welcome to Random but Memorable, a podcast from 1Password. I'm Anna, the producer behind the show. I'm Sarah, one of the founders at 1Password. I'm Rue, head of password manager development. I'm Matt Davey, 1Password's chief experience officer. And we're the hosts behind Random but Memorable. Together, we offer up bi-weekly security advice, interview special guests from the cybersecurity community, and round up the latest security news in Watchtower Weekly. We may even play a silly game or two. So sit back and enjoy the show. I'm not sure I've got five minutes in me today, honestly. Are you melting? I, uh, it's not that I'm melting. The British heat it's wave. Just, I've been indoors for all of the nice weather over the last three days. Because there's, there's so much to do. And to go outside, you basically have to bake. Like, it's it's been so hot here that any kind of five minutes outside, you end up dehydrated. Oh, look, a British person talking about the weather. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what sucks about being friends with you two is that your accents are no longer novel for me. And I think the things that I used to, oh. I would once find joy in just listening to you, it's just normal. <laughs> so Are you disowning us as friends now? Some of the bloom has fallen off the rose, if I'm honest with you. And, and it's <laughs> what I'm finding is that now I have to figure out if, if I'm friends with you for your personalities instead of just your delightful accents. Oh, right. If you actually like us. Yeah. Yeah. How wonderful. How's that coming? I could put on regional accents all the time. I, I just, <laughs> I think I would end up, I would leave a wake of, of insults. <laughs> I played your Michael Caine for Carrie the other day and she she like full voice cackled. She thought it was so great. She was just she was she, it was the greatest thing. Not a lot of people know that. <laughs> yeah. I, I listened back and was like, that is the worst Michael Caine accent. It's, I think I've... <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. It's not but good. It's great. It's not good, but it's also great. So it's the original trio. It is. It's us. And Anna, you seem to be sitting about three meters away from your microphone. I don't know whether you want to fix that or not. I know. It's so quiet. I'm like trying to like turn the gain up over Oh, here. hang on. Let me turn myself up. Is that better? We'll just move it close to your face. I'm like works. right on it. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> that, that came up. When you say, you know, regional accent. That was Norfolk. Anna's Norfolk comes through very occasionally, but when it does, it is delightful. <laughs> I am right on it. <laughs> right on it. I'm right on it, bruh. I am uh, right on it. Hey, you got a light, boy? <laughs> <laughs> See? God, it does it to me every time. I can't, I can't help it. I just love it so much. I was walking to the shop the other day and a cyclist was on the pavement coming towards me. And he literally just shouted at me, "You are watch you out," and I, <laughs> and I just I, the, it it was more confusing. I ended up moving just because he was coming towards me, not because I fully understood what he said. <laughs> you want to watch you out, boy? And I was just like, I think that means move. <laughs> there is an actual road sign, Rue, in Norfolk that says "slow you down." Slow, slow you down. down. Oh God! <laughs> Which is just so good. <laughs> I love it. That's great. It's so delightful. Oh, God. All right. Uh, coming up on the show today, we have a guest interview with Tracy Chow, who is the founder of Block Party. We talk about its latest browser extension tool, Privacy Party, and how it can help deep clean your social media, notifications, settings, and a whole lot more. Tracy spoke very candidly about her personal experience with online harassment and how it inspired her to found the company. She definitely restored my faith in humanity, so it's worth sticking around for this one. Nice. Looking forward to it. Okay. This is the first part of the show where we dive into something that's been happening in the last couple of weeks, either at 1Password or in our personal lives. So what's in the vault this week? So I thought we could use this time to talk about my personal experience I had with a Booking.com scam. Oh. First off, have either of you used Booking.com before? Uh, booking. Yeah, I have. Oh, well, yeah. I was more of a Hotels.com person. Oh, okay. I'm kind of an Expedia person these days, but I've, I've used Booking before. And have you ever received WhatsApp messages as part of your accommodation reservation for anything? Mm, no. No, I don't like that very much. No, thank you. Yeah, so this scam came in the form of a WhatsApp message, which at first I didn't think was odd because I've had past experiences where I've booked hotels through Booking.com 
And they have contacted me via WhatsApp to arrange how to check in and things like that. Just this summer, I stayed in Rome and I had an apartment contact me via WhatsApp. And that was all very normal, all very professional. So at first, this didn't really seem that weird to me. But I got a message from what was claiming to be a hotel that I've booked to stay in Amsterdam next year. And the message had all of like my hotel details, including the name of the hotel, my full name and the dates that I was staying there. It also knew the exact amount that I paid for the accommodation. And this message was saying that basically the hotel works with an online only check in system. And before checking in, I would need to verify myself. So it said in order to do this, I would need to confirm my reservation and fill out this form with a link to the form. Uh, the link was something like booking.shop, dot a load of letters and numbers. And then once I'd filled out this form, it said I would receive two SMS codes and I must enter them to finalise the booking. Aww. But yeah, this all looked really legitimate to me so far. So I clicked on the link and it sent me through to a page that looks identical to booking.com. Uh, it had the exact cost of my stay at the top, photos of the hotel and the dates of my trip. And it was asking me to enter all of my personal details and even like if I was traveling for work and all that kind of stuff. And then finally, my payment details. It even had like all of the T's and C's and privacy notice links at the bottom. But I'd already given all of this information to booking.com. So I was a little bit suspicious by this point. So I decided to click on a few of the links at the bottom of the page and I realised that none of them worked. So that was enough to get me even more suspicious. So I kind of paused for a second, which took a lot of willpower for me because I don't know about you, but I'm the kind of person that when I have a life admin task to do, I just want to action it immediately if it takes a couple of minutes and just get it done oh, yeah. so I can move on with my life and forget about it. But... Yeah, I don't know. Something seemed dodgy about this whole thing, even though it all looked super convincing. So from there, I quickly googled booking.com scam. And there were so many accounts on Reddit and other forums of people with similar experiences, kind of warning that this was a scam. So alarm bells started ringing and I quickly closed the page and blocked the account on WhatsApp. And then I flagged it with booking.com. But yeah, I tried to do a bit of digging into booking.com and if it's been hacked recently and I went on have I been pwned and things to check, but I couldn't find much evidence on it, to be honest. And mm. My theory was just that either they've been hacked and maybe not disclosed it or maybe the hotel itself got breached and stole all the reservation and guest details, but I don't know. So I had something like sort of maybe similar I recently started putting a few things on, on Etsy, and as soon as I uploaded my first thing, I got an email from someone with like a, hey, it wasn't a message from Etsy, it was a message from like someone random, and they were like, you've done this wrong, scan this QR code to fix your listing. And I think actually a lot of these services like Etsy, like Booking.com, have like notifiers for when something gets booked. I don't know how they would find your, like, guest information, yeah. but I wonder whether a lot of the information that you've spoken about is actually public. So, like, the cost of the hotel is obviously, like, a public amount. If you were staying for one night, they'd, they'd have the rough information. But, like, they probably wouldn't have your name, and they wouldn't have, like, how long you were staying, I doubt. But, like... They might be able to get some of this other stuff from advertisers and then just use WhatsApp. But, like, how they'd contact you, I, I don't know. Like, Booking.com yeah. must be giving out this information. But, yeah, it's scary because for someone who works in the cybersecurity realm with this, like, at the forefront of my mind on a daily basis, I was still so close to filling out this form. Yeah. The worst thing is, like, they would have probably had me if they hadn't have put the credit card up front right mm. away. Like, they probably would have had me if they, like, booking.shop, because booking.com uses, like, all the different URLs. Yeah. I'm like, I would probably fall for that. And then 
if it was just entering in like check-in information like your name or or like anything like that mm. i probably would have done it yeah and then if they'd followed up with me a couple of days later to be like hey you know we we see you're staying at this date i, I hope i'm not giving them ideas here but like, <laughs> but like it, it, do you know what i mean like if they built that trust with me initially of like nothing happened after i entered that first bit of information yeah in, I, I probably would have fallen for the card a lot easier later on so it is really dangerous. Yeah. It's getting harder and harder, I think, to yeah. decipher what's real and what's not. I like the fact that I'm trying to fix their user experience, uh, <laughs> despite it I'm being a scam. a scam. Yep. Don't give them ideas, Matt. Uh, and I'm glad you didn't get taken in. <laughs> Thank you. Taken in? What? It's not the upside down. <laughs> it's, it sounded like a Liam Neeson movie or something. Oh. Like, they were just after oh her credit God. card. Taken in, taken in by the scam. So <laughs> let's dive into some Watchtower Weekly. This is the part of the show where we pick a couple of news headlines or security articles that have grabbed our attention in the last week or so and share what we think about them. First up today, we have a quick follow-up on the last episode's story. And that story is the CrowdStrike story, of course. So, CrowdStrike have experienced backlash, fresh backlash, over $10 apology voucher. So CrowdStrike is giving staff and firms they work with a $10 Uber Eats voucher to say sorry for a global IT outage that recently caused chaos across airlines, banks and hospitals and is now facing fresh backlash. The cybersecurity company said in an email to its partners that it recognised the incident had caused extra work. To express our gratitude, your next cup of coffee or late night snack is on us, CrowdStrike wrote. <laughs> <laughs> that is so incredibly tone deaf. I I applaud the tone deafness of this. It's incredible. I don't know how this got through, honestly. This is so good. And it probably, if you think of the amount of people that they probably sent this to, I bet it cost an absolute fortune as well. Yeah. I bet it did. And that's probably why they thought it was okay. Like, what? We're spending $2 million on this? Like, you'd think that this is a good apology. Like, no, it's $10 per person, bud. Don't do that. Yeah. It would seem the gesture was not really appreciated by some. One Redditor user branded it an absolute clown show, while another said, I literally wanted to drive my car off a bridge this weekend and they bought me a coffee. Nice. Extreme. One LinkedIn user claiming to be a CrowdStrike partner said, the gesture of a cup of coffee or a Uber Eats credit as an apology does not seem to make up for the tens of thousands lost in person hours and customer trust due to the July 19th incident. CrowdStrike confirmed to the BBC that it sent vouchers to teammates and partners who had helped customers deal with the impact of the outage. Some people who said that they had received a voucher also took to social media to say that it didn't then work. Uber flagged it as fraud because of high usage rates, CrowdStrike admitted. Wow. Yikes. It comes amid growing questions about what financial compensation CrowdStrike customers and people impacted by the outage will be able to claim. The firm has pledged to improve its software tests after a faulty content update for Windows systems caused the mass IT outage. Its mistake resulted in problems for banks, hospitals and airlines as millions of PCs displayed the blue screen of death. So, Rue, did you get 10 bucks? No, I didn't get 10 bucks. Uh, that was our wellness day though so i got 10 bucks in free ice cream or whatever it was we were giving out that day oh yeah we did get we did get 10 bucks to spend on ice cream that was pretty good but not from crowdstrike <laughs> not from crowdstrike no do you know what this reminds me of this just reminds me of like you've had a terrible meal in a restaurant and yeah. they offer you just like a free drink to make up for amends you know like okay <laughs> Ten dollars in CrowdStrike cash would have yeah. been much better. <laughs> I appreciate the gesture, but like it's not gonna make up for the stone cold chicken I've just eaten or something. You're right, Anna. I love that. Yeah. I had a raw sausage once. Oh. Did you get a free raw. drink? They gave me a free dessert. Great. Which is it's even worse because I wanted to just go home because I'd just eaten a, a bit of a raw sausage. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And oh. And, like, then they wanted to add ice cream on top of that. And when I said, no, I don't want a free dessert, they did nothing else. Great. <laughs> so, wow. so it's like, hey, you might have food poisoning and you're probably really just, yeah. you know, culminating and thinking about, uh, you know, how you're going to be ill. Uh, would you like ice cream? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, here's the thing. Like, at least you know that they're good at delivering things cold. So that dessert would would have been perfect. Ice cream? Fine. <laughs> 
Okay, so this next one. Background check company breached nearly three billion exposed in data theft. This is from Mashable. So unfortunately, this could mean that you might have been affected by one of the biggest data breaches ever and not even known it. A recent class action lawsuit filed against Jericho Pictures, Inc., a background check company that does business under the name National Public Data, claims that the company was breached by hackers earlier this year. As a result, the lawsuit says confidential data for 2.9 billion people was exposed and stolen by a hacker group known as USDOD. Like I said, to make matters even worse, because of the nature of the company, those affected by this cyber attack may not even know they could be involved. This is because national public data gathers its data by scraping information about individuals from non-public sources without their knowledge or consent. The exposed information contains varying details for nearly 3 billion people, which include names, former and current addresses, and social security numbers, as well as personal data tied to family members, and relatives who are both living and deceased. This breach was previously unknown to the public. It's unclear when exactly the breach occurred. One victim of the hack, Christopher Hoffman, said that he only became aware of the issue when an identity theft protection service notified him in July that his personal information had been compromised and leaked on the dark web. The hackers posted a national public database containing the leaked information on a dark web hacking forum in April of this year and sought $3.5 million from a potential buyer. Just last month, we discussed the Rock Q 2024 data breach on the show. This was another large data breach, which saw nearly 10 billion users' password credentials being exposed. However, we did establish that the data was updated and, and basically a compilation of, of previous leaks and breaches from years earlier. So with billions exposed in a national public data breach... This now appears to be one of the biggest single data breaches ever, only rivaled by Yahoo's 2013 data breach, which affected 3 billion accounts. I mean, just where the information came from, just like the fact that companies like this exist. This is rough. This is a rough one, like a background check company being breached. I'm almost surprised that we don't hear more of these. They've got to be treasure troves for information. This feels like every episode at the moment we talk about like the biggest data breach of all time. Yeah. Most of them are like compilations, but it looks like this one is just kind of a huge standalone data set, which is pretty scary. Yeah. Hoy. So now that we've wrapped up Watchtower Weekly, let's move on to my interview with Tracy Chow. With our lives becoming increasingly shared online for all to see, Tracy is on an important mission with Privacy Party to give some control back to the user and empower them to be safer on social media. As I alluded to a little earlier, this interview touches on themes of online harassment, trolling, and stalking. So if any of those topics are triggering for you, it might be best to skip ahead and give this one a miss. But otherwise, I think this is a super interesting conversation, and I hope everyone listening will be able to take something away from it. Stopping by for a chat today is Tracy Chow. Tracy is the founder and CEO of Block Party, which builds tools for online safety, privacy, and anti-harassment. Their latest product, Privacy Party, helps people find and fix privacy risks on social media. Tracy is an entrepreneur and software engineer, also known for her work advocating for diversity and inclusion in tech. In 2016, she co-founded the nonprofit project Include, which works with tech startups on diversity towards a mission of giving everyone a fair chance to succeed in tech. In 2022, she was named one of Time's 12 Women of the Year. Tracy, just by that intro, I know there's going to be a huge amount we can talk about and cover on the show today. So let's not waste any more time. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. 2022 Time's 12 Women of the Year. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I was a little surprised, but very flattered. Yes, it was fun. That's awesome. Was that in print? Like, do you have the magazine? It was in print. Yes, I have a few copies, which I will never look at my mom likes to have the copies on hand of course ah, that's awesome i love that that's really really cool all right why don't we start out with a little bit of your background like how did you get started in tech how did you get started in cybersecurity? like how did you go from where you were to where you are today i had a very charmed entry into tech i would say growing up in silicon valley both of my parents are software engineers i went to school at stanford and studied electrical engineering computer science So it felt like a very well-paved road straight into tech companies. I worked at a few of the big platform companies early on. So I interned at Google and Facebook. And then when I graduated from school, I worked at a couple of early stage startups. I worked at Quora, 
joined as a second engineer, hired onto the team. I joined Pinterest when it was about 10 people. And so got to be a part of building some of these platforms from the ground up. Super fun to be working on literally everything from infrastructure and APIs to the websites, moderation tools, thinking about what policies we should have for content and user interactions on these user-generated content sites. So I had all of that very fun experience on the building side of these platforms. In parallel to being an engineer, I started to do a bunch of diversity and inclusion activism work, which led me to personally building more of a platform. And then that exposed me to some of the less savory parts of the internet. So abuse and harassment, the range of everything from garden variety, sexism and racism to pretty targeted, sustained harassment and stalking. So I started to have a very personal interest in security because of that. We get things like the 10,000 password reset requests. It's like, oh, somebody's trying to get into my account. Okay, I see this. I need to lock this down. But also things like stalkers who showed up in person where I was after having flown around the world to find me. So I not thought that they were going to be threats. And then they got on a plane and showed up, which then made me much more sensitive to things like location tagging and photos and sharing photos in real time from where I was. Working on Block Party came directly out of these two different parts of my background, one on the engineering and product side, building platforms, understanding how they work, and the other from the personal experience of dealing with safety and privacy and security issues and wanting to build better solutions for that. For me and also for everybody else who might be similar to me and maybe they want to start a whole company around building these tools. I have to imagine that it was not difficult to find people who were in similar situations as you who had a need for these exact same things. Like this is half the population is is potential market for you here and, and needs needs help. Yeah, it was pretty unfortunate to, to hear all the stories that people have shared. I would say there's certain classes of stories that are easier to talk about publicly. So some of the more severe harassment cases, you'll see people writing about them. Often the people who are dealing with these are people who have a little bit more of a profile too, and they're willing to use their platform to shed light on these issues. But sometimes it's very difficult to talk about security and privacy issues. You don't necessarily want your stalker to know what you are doing to defend against their attacks. If you have a dedicated stalker, you also don't want them to know that they're getting through to you or that you're aware and tracking down what they're doing. So I have talked to quite a few people as well, mostly women who've dealt with these safety, security issues, being nervous about stalkers literally showing up where they are, but they've never been able to talk to anybody about these things. They definitely can't use their platforms or talk about these things in a public setting at all. So I actually have found quite a few people who like really just wanted to tell me because they couldn't talk to anybody else who would understand and really empathize with them. Yeah. Okay. So let's, for those who haven't heard, can you talk a little bit about Privacy Party and like what it is, what it does, how it works? Yeah. Privacy Party is a browser extension that helps you to deep clean your social media, the settings and the notifications so that you don't have any accidental overexposure of your data. You can also just go clean up all the stuff you don't want on there anymore. So we support all the major social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and also some platforms that you might not always think of first as social platforms like Venmo and Strava, which leak a lot of actually very important data. Venmo, your financial transactions, and also some of the people closest to you. Strava, if you're running and cycling, starting from home or places that you frequent regularly, especially with the default public profiles on both Venmo and Strava, you're giving the whole internet a lot of information. Yeah. The Strava one, the thing that triggers for me was there was a story a number of years ago where U.S. troops were using Strava during exercises when they were on deployment. Yes. And it was just like, oh, well, that's the outline of a base that's out. Yeah. The heat map would show yes. clearly in the middle of the desert where there shouldn't be anything. Exactly. It's a very well-trodden path. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There was also um, the story of a Russian commander who was sniped and killed on it seemed like his daily jog. He was posting oh. all of his runs to struggle publicly. Yikes. That's, yeah, that's not, that's not great. Okay, so Privacy Party will go through and it'll lock down your settings for one. Yeah. And it will also scrub, like, 
old posts and stuff like that? Yeah. So we're, we have a bunch of automations that will help you delete old things if you would like to. Um, so for example, remove all your Instagram posts. If you just want to delete everything, remove all your old Twitter posts. You can go do that now. There's also things like untagging photos on Facebook. If you don't necessarily need all those things showing up for you anymore. So the way the extension works is that it will scan through your accounts and your settings and flag you to potential risks you have. So in the same way that a virus scanner might run on your computer and then let you know, hey, there's some things here. Do you want to take a look? We do have a very strong theme of user empowerment all through the products we build. So it's not just we're going to do all this for you, but we're going to put it in front of you so it's easy for you to do, but you're in full control and you can make the decision. Like, yes, I want to click this button to go delete all my old posts. Or I want to click this button to lock down all my settings. That's really cool. That's that's really cool. And this all runs within a browser extension. It does, yes. There are some very nice things about building this product as a browser extension for privacy reasons as well, because we're sitting literally on top of your browser, almost like a friend who's leaning over your shoulder as you're at your laptop and clicking on things for you. But we can't do anything when you've closed your computer. We don't have to hold your account credentials. We do not want that. We just have access when you have access and let us run over your browser windows open to these social media platforms. That's really cool. That reduces your surface area quite a bit. Yes. That's super cool. I like that. Okay, cool. So what was the catalyst for Privacy Party? Was there like a particular thing that happened to you where you're like, okay, enough is enough. Time to do something about this. And I think I, I know just the thing to do. It's hard to pinpoint one singular moment because it felt like I was just getting this gradual increase over time of harassment and stalking and weirdos online. But there were a couple of, if I had to call them out, catalytic moments. One was, this is sort of a crazy story, someone who was very obsessed with the idea that I was in a secret relationship with James Comey and started posting a lot on Twitter and Instagram about this, started photoshopping us together and continuing this crazy narrative that I was at first the secret girlfriend and then the wife, the second wife. I don't know. It was it was really ludicrous. Wait, sorry. James Comey, FBI James yes, Comey? Correct. <laughs> okay. Yes. And just, just for the record, you were not. I, I have no connection to James Comey. I have... Oh my no gosh. Well, wow. like, I don't know where this came from. They created many accounts to try to push forward, advance this conspiracy theory. And I went and tried to report the accounts on Twitter and Instagram. I think there were like 40 posts on Instagram that I went and recorded in one go. And the reports got returned to me with, we see no evidence of any issue. But thank you for your contributions to try to make Instagram in a welcoming community. I screenshotted a bunch of this stuff and posted it on my personal Facebook where I am friends with some of the people who work at these different companies. And almost immediately I got a response, which is like, oh, this is not cool. We will escalate internally. We'll make sure our trust and safety as a team is handling this. And they did get some of these accounts taken down. But I actually really hated that idea that I could have special access First of all, I don't like that this stuff is happening, but also that I can't do anything about it through normal channels. I need to get this escalation through privileged channels. I just felt like something is super broken with all of this. There were cases also, that was like one of the catalyzing moments. The other was dealing with the stalker I kind of mentioned earlier who literally showed up where I was a few times. And I had to go to San Francisco Police Department to try to report it. I'm getting gaslit. They were like, it's not really an issue. Nothing's happened. We're not going to do anything unless something happens and probably harmless anyways. And one of the pieces of advice I got in response to that situation when I started talking to more folks for advice, um, private security, one of the pieces of advice I got was it can feel really debilitating to feel like you're helpless and you can't do anything just because there are some crazy people who have decided to target you and potentially even upturn your life. But that mindset, feeling that helplessness can be actually the worst thing, it then shades everything else you're doing. You just feel like you're completely stuck. But what you can do is turn it around. Think about what agency you do have. In the case of a stalker, think about what information are you potentially exposing. Think from their perspective. 
with the information you put out there, what can they do with that to potentially get to you or harm you? And then lock down your stuff so that doesn't happen. So you have something to do. You can be more proactive about it. Think about the agency you do have. You may not have full agency. You may not have full control and it can be very frustrating, but you do have some control and you can exert your agency. For me, I took it to an extreme of starting a company around building these tools. But there's also that theme of user empowerment, right? Like as I mentioned through all of our products, which is we are helping you to make better decisions and exert the preferences and controls that you want. So you can have the experience you want. And again, even if you don't have full control over everything, because there are limits to what's technically possible or to what the platforms allow, you can still do something to make your experience better. When all this was happening, were you what someone would consider a public figure of any kind? Like, did you have a high profile online or were you just a normal that this was happening to? That's a good question. At the point that it got to James Comey conspiracy theory, I was slightly more of a quote unquote public figure in that I had been doing diversity and inclusion activism for a while. So I had in the tens of thousands, if not like a hundred thousand followers on Twitter. So like reasonable profile, but I would say even well before that, when I was a normal nobody on the internet, I got harassment and crazy stuff back then too. I think that was just the experience of being a woman who is online and happening to cross paths with people who, I don't know, had some sort of insecurity or other issues that they were working out. Yeah. Yeah. And that was sort of like the, you know, the the reason I asked was, I'm assuming you were your first alpha and beta tester. You were your own alpha and beta tester. When you started putting these things in place, when you started building the software, did you notice, was there like an immediate moment or was it more like a a gradual taper where you're like, okay, like things are getting better for me? Like when was the moment when you knew that you were like onto something here and that it was working? It was pretty immediate. Um, The first tool that we built was a set of anti-harassment tools on top of Twitter. So I plugged it into my Twitter account and it was like immediately breathing a sigh of relief to not have to potentially deal with this stuff. It used to be the case that I would check my Twitter to an unhealthy degree all times of day, walking to the grocery store in between meetings, brushing my teeth, but I'd be checking my phone and checking Twitter all the time. And on a semi-regular basis, I would get nasty comments in my mentions. And sometimes it just felt like a slap in the face, seeing the nastiness set my way, even if I knew that it was ridiculous, there was no grounding to it. It just feels bad to have somebody send something so nasty to you. I would maybe draw an analogy to like walking down the street and like somebody harasses you on the street or like shouts at you, even if you can brush it off, you know, it's nothing significant. It still kind of throws you off your course, can sit a little while with you, like it can disturb your mental peace. Once I had our automatic filtering running on Twitter, I was like, oh, I'm just not, I'm not going to see that stuff anymore. Like, I just feel like I'm protected. The product we had then, we used to be building on top of the Twitter API. And once ownership changed there, we had to put the product on hiatus. But it was really nice to have this filtering, but we would then sort things into a sort of like spam folder where you could still go see everything that's been filtered, Hmm. which was important for a couple of use cases. But knowing that I had my filters on pretty strong and I could always go check things later, I didn't have the FOMO, like I might miss out. I just felt a lot better. It's like, oh, I had this like nice little shield. Yeah, yeah. And that peace of mind was pretty incredible. It's also something that we've been trying to get to with our new products is just like, how do we get people to feel instead of that unease or uncertainty, the distrust of being online. There's a lot of like negative stuff online. You have to be afraid of or worried for scams and fraud and all sorts of bad stuff. Like how do we give people back that sense of control and ease and feel like things are going to be okay? You've done the things that you need to do to protect yourself and shield yourself. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. That's amazing to like have really like a light switch moment with it. Yeah. Okay. So I am a parent. Does privacy party help? me with the kids if they're starting to get like dip their toes into social media and and online presence and stuff like that? For sure. What we're starting with this is for the platforms we do support, you can treat the recommendations we have as a sort of walkthrough. So if you're a parent who may not 
know all the ins and outs of a platform that your kid wants to use. You can use Privacy Party as that guide that will walk you through. Here are the basic settings that we should run through. So instead of you having to go look up everything about what is this platform, what are the settings I should know about, and what are the recommendations on what the settings should be set at, we'll take you through those. And they're also a good tool, these recommendations as conversation starters to talk about how to be a citizen online, like what are the things that you should be paying attention to as you participate in these digital spaces. Yeah. Yeah. We've had some of those conversations, particularly with our daughter, and we've we've taken a fairly like I would say conservative stance with access to social media and stuff. Like we tried to as much as possible limit her access to things and we talked to her about privacy online and not making things public by default and, and stuff like that. But it's really nice to know there's also a tool that can like help us because, you know, today it might be TikTok. Tomorrow it's going to be some other ridiculously named service that I definitely won't use myself and will have no idea how to set. Even TikTok. My God, have you gone through like account settings on TikTok? It is the most convoluted mess I've ever seen in my life. I don't understand how people use this. And I'm not. I'm a technologist. I'm not dumb. Yes, you're very tech savvy. <laughs> yes. Yes. Like, what are we doing here, people? Yeah. It's I've crazy. Heard the whole range of responses from parents who are very tech savvy, work in tech, to not at all, and how people have decided to deal with these issues. Some are just like, I'm not going to figure it out. My kids are going to figure out workarounds. So just let them do whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't like that. The answer for me is like, well, you just yeah. don't get to use this. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just that. That's it. Yeah. Okay. There is sort of this this opinion going around that social media is getting worse when it comes to privacy risks and online safety. Is that a trend that you are also seeing? Like, is that something that you agree with, or do you see it slightly differently from your position? I think it's hard to say definitively with data and research because it is so hard to measure what exactly we mean. I do think. Over time, the trend has moved towards open and sharing and public by default. If I remember the earliest days of getting online, you weren't supposed to share your real name because it was dangerous. Yeah. And it's like, oh, yes, like you don't yeah. want strangers to know who you are. So you can set up a geo cities, but not with your real name. <laughs> but now there's much yeah. more of this push towards authenticity and like, who are you? And you share real things and real details about yourself. And it is true that if you are very authentic and share really all these aspects of your life, then people can connect with you more. But we can build community online. But the flip side of that is giving up a lot of privacy. And there are the really tricky interactions with public figures, whether they're like celebrities or micro influencers and their followers developing parasocial relationships with them. Or just people who shouldn't have access to information, seeking it out and finding it. So I think there's just generally that cultural trend in addition to the technical side where I mean, culture is somewhat defined by the technology as well. When platforms have defaults that are all public, that encourages a certain type of behavior. The fact that Venmo has all transactions be public by default, yes. has invested a ton in the emoji. So it's kind of fun to see the transactions that are happening. It creates a certain culture around sharing. Yeah. Honestly, it's a little wild. Yeah. That was wild to me. Like I, this is where I can tell that like, I'm not as hip as I used to be because I only started using Venmo like a couple of years ago. But I remember at the time being like, why is all this public? Why does everyone need to know what I'm paying the babysitter, when I'm paying the babysitter. This doesn't make any sense to me that this is just default. Yeah. And that feels like more innocuous, but there's also cases that are much worse. But we've also heard stories from folks like someone paying their landlord on Venmo and then getting doxxed because of it. Somebody's trying to figure out where you live. They figure out, oh, you're paying your landlord. Their information is relatively public about what properties they have. Right. And they can figure out where you live. Yeah. Why? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In terms of like changes to the privacy landscape with things like TikTok, things like Instagram and Reels and stuff like that, there is this public by default normalization that I think is happening that changes the mindset from where you and I started online, which is like, ooh, like let's be careful about what we're putting out there and just like keep it as, as tight a closed circle as possible. Yeah. So 
I can see that certainly as like new people are getting online all the time, being public is normal to them, but also can be very dangerous. I think there's also this encouragement for people to mine their personal lives for content, to create content yeah. around everything that's happening. Yeah. Like I've been online with the semi public presence for a little while now and I've been through all of this, like oh, what are the parts of my personal life I can create content out of? And it seemed okay for a while until it's not and somebody knows too much about you and it can get used against you. Yeah. But yeah, in terms of like other privacy landscape things, the fact that Europe has been pushing forward with a lot of privacy legislation and regulation does indicate to me also that there is a shift in broader public perception and demands around data and privacy. The U.S. is not as far along with that. You see more patchwork regulation. California has some privacy regulation. A few other states have introduced it. But just knowing that dynamic around what legislation actually makes it through and like what people care about. Like legislators, regulators don't push stuff through unless people care about it. And so there is a bit of a shift in these expectations now around data and privacy, which I think is encouraging. I think the tech industry is still trying to figure out what exactly to do with all of this. I would say with something like GDPR, mixed success, I think it actually has been pretty good at getting tech companies to store less data or companies in general, but particularly tech companies having a reason to store data instead of just storing by default because it could be useful in the future. But it's also been pretty annoying for consumers where I think most people's experience with it is the cookies banners whenever you're yeah. visiting sites in Europe. Yep. So it's taking a few steps forward, maybe a few steps back as well in user experience and expectations. Yeah. Okay. Where do you think the responsibility lies for prioritization and awareness of privacy and online safety. Is that regulation? Is that platform vendors? I, I, I'm, I'm sure that part of your answer will be parents and, and, and individuals themselves. But like, where, where do you see that responsibility sitting with most? I think it's hard to say that it sits with one group the most. I think it has to be an ecosystem-wide effort. There's a lot of people who call on tech companies to do better and not have so many dark patterns and not slurp everybody's data. Sure. But also we have to be aware of what their economic incentives are, their business incentives, which are going to push in one direction. Yeah. There's regulation, which has to be a part of the picture just because if we don't have regulation guardrails in place. There's no reason for tech companies to do things that don't suit their bottom line. I think lost in this discussion about tech companies versus regulators is sometimes the role of individuals and what individual people can do. I think there is a lot of this helplessness that people sometimes experience and then feel like, oh, there's just, there's nothing <laughs> because it feels so overwhelming or the systems that be the powers that be have made it so I can't do anything anyway, so I just stop caring. And again, I would counsel against that sort of feeling of helplessness and push people to think about what agency they do have at many different levels. One is actually pushing for regulation. But I think some of what we need to see around privacy and safety is regulators forcing tech companies to allow for different experiences and better tooling for individuals to be able to exert their rights. Yeah. All right. I want to switch gears just a little bit. How do you see your efforts with Privacy Party intersecting with your work in diversity inclusion, particularly in terms of like online safe spaces and, and marginalized communities? Yeah. Just from the very personal note, I started off caring more about safety and privacy from the personal experience of having been a DEI activist and experiencing some of the vitriol that came back to me around that, which led me to very viscerally appreciate and understand how some of the people that we most need to hear from the activists who are going to say things that feel unpopular or are different than the status quo will be the ones who are on the forefront of receiving negativity and abuse and harassment in the form that is meant to silence. And so there's just the loss of a lot of voices and perspectives we get that hurts all of society when our spaces online can be weaponized in this way and people who can't be safe 
are getting attacked just have to step away. And it's not just online. I would say also, if you look at the political sphere, there have been politicians, MPs who have stood down from elections because of the abuse they've gotten, like online abuse that they've gotten. So even democratic representation becomes a problem. Or journalism, like female journalists and journalists of color get targeted a lot more. And if we don't solve that problem, what we end up with in an end stage is the only people left telling these stories or reporting come from specific demographics, or they have a very particular sort of personality where they don't mind dealing with abuse, which is also not so great. But even apart from public figures or people who are trying to be a part of public spaces, the internet has been really important and very useful for people from marginalized communities to find each other and be able to build solidarity. And so when these spaces become unsafe as well, like there's a big loss for people who otherwise might be able to find connection and support. When I look at the people who've been able to help with our products at Block Party, with the original Twitter products and with Privacy Party, I feel really good about helping people to stay online and take advantage of the good stuff of being online which is community and connection and learning exposed to different perspectives and also for the people who want to be able to speak and have voice so that the rest of the world can hear from them. They are more protected and can continue to do that speaking. That's really cool. Sorry, I don't want to like sound too cheesy, but that's like a really beautiful point of view on all of this. It really is. It's also very noble. I think I actually have... I have a more optimistic view on the internet than people sometimes would expect because they think like, oh, you're trying to tamp down all the bad stuff. Like you must just be looking at harassment and abuse and privacy invasions and horrible things all the time. But I'm actually very optimistic about what is possible with the internet. I personally experience a lot of the good stuff, like having done activism work and use platforms like Twitter to get a message out, get a movement going, and then very personally meeting interesting people, learning from interesting people online. I see a lot of that good there. I worked at Facebook in 2008, but it was still this early vision of like, let's connect the world. I was like, oh yeah, like that was pretty powerful. Like the internet is a pretty cool thing. So I want us to be able to get back to that promise of the internet, to all the good stuff by cleaning up the bad. So people don't just have to throw out the good with the bad. Yeah, that's really cool. I like that a lot. All right, Tracy, this has been really great. To wrap up, for anyone listening who would love to give Privacy Party a try or learn more about your work, where should they go? This is so ironic because in the name of trying to advance privacy for other people, I need to be very not private myself. (laughs) You can find information about Privacy Party at privacypartyapp.com. And I am online in most places as Trickatora which is a made-up word from the era of the internet where we were not supposed to use our name. So I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, basically anywhere. It's Trikatora, T-R-I-K-E-T-O-R-A. Nice. That's awesome. Okay, Tracy, thank you so much for coming. This has been a ton of fun. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for a super fun conversation. Okay, I think it's time for Ask One Password, our new advice segment, where you can ask Rue anything. I don't think we've had enough stupid questions, so you can really ask Rue anything. Yeah. And this is where we will answer questions from our listeners, whether that be cybersecurity related or existential woes. I might also attempt a bad accent or two. (laughs) So this week we have a question from Uma who says, Hey, Agony Aunt Rue and the rest of the podcast gang, this might be a slightly cheeky question. Oh, I'm in very interested in where this goes now. <laughs> now I can't wait. <laughs> but I'm curious to know, when it comes to security or tech use in general, what bad habit do you have that you pretend that you don't have? Oh. Uh, I ask because I think we're all guilty of having some bad digital habits and hygiene for the sake of convenience and to save us time. You hear a lot of people talk about best practices, but not really admit the things that they still do that they know they need to improve. As likely, they are bad habits shared by a lot of us. Thanks to everyone involved in the podcast. I've been listening since it started and still look forward to every episode. Best wishes, Uma. P.S. Any tips you have for getting red wine stains out of carpet would be hugely appreciated. (laughs) 
So I my bad habit is that I use the same password for everything and <laughs> I keep them I keep them all stored in a Google Sheets thing so I can just access them oh. online whenever I need to. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that's better than writing them down, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've actually seen one of these before. Someone forwarded me one from their employer, and they were like, hey, look at this, isn't it bad? And it still contained all of the passwords. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, gosh. It was atrocious. Like, oh, the havoc you could wreak. Yeah. Oh. Gosh. But you don't actually do that, Marie. We, we have to establish that. No, I yeah. don't. Of course, I don't actually do that. Yeah, sorry. I use one password and, and every password is random. Okay, I'll tell you what I do. And I think this will make Matt cringe too. I list my phone number and my email address on my website. <laughs> like my personal phone number and personal email address are on my website. That's a thing I do. Do you get much, uh, much spam from that? No, I don't. I, I really don't. <laughs> and and this comes from someone who calls people as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I just, I'll just call you. Like, who, who literally just out of the blue just phones you. I love a Rue call, though. They do just come out of the blue. Here's the thing. I only do that to people I really care about. Oh, I feel honoured. Oh, I know you really care because you gave me 15 minutes warning yesterday, so. <laughs> 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 That's the British way. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you on June the 19th at 2 p.m. <laughs> I I love that if we get a reminder email sent in on June <laughs> June the 19th <laughs> from someone randomly listening to an old episode. <laughs> do you know what I do? My bad habit is uh, IoT. I just plug and play like all my IoT devices. Oh, gosh. Oh, that, that makes me really anxious. Yeah, I know that you should change the default password settings and you should go through some of the privacy settings but yeah i don't do that and i know that's super bad but i need to do something about that that makes me nervous what about you matt hands down dan comes behind you and and adds all the security second settings in oh yeah i'm hoping i'm hoping that that's the case but i don't know whether it's a security thing but what i definitely do is change my email address that i'm using far too often and so when it comes to, like, an account, I will have changed my email address and then I no longer have access to that account. And I won't go and tidy it up. I won't go and, like, you know, talk to support for 30 minutes to try and prove who I am and close it. I will just open another one. So I think there's a bunch of accounts out there that I don't really know what's in them. And also I don't have access. But, like, someone maybe does. I don't know. Yeah. Because I like, I no, no longer own that email address. Yeah, yeah. This has been helpful. I'm glad we did this. Yeah. In terms of the wine spill, I mean, at this point, it's no longer fresh. So you're, you are now okay. If it's a fresh wine spill, you can go after it with like baking soda, like a whole bunch of baking soda and a little bit of water. I've heard white wine, white wine on red wine. Really? You think so? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Don't quote me on that, but that's something I've heard. Okay. Since this, at this point, is a, is a dried stain, it's going to be a dish soap, vinegar, warm water attack. Uh, if you have a little green machine, those are those are wonderful, and you can actually load the reservoir with some uh, dish soap and vinegar and just start going at it. The thing to remember, though, is that it's you are. This is not an instantaneous fix. You have you are going to have to put in the work. Uh, you are going to be doing this for a while. You'll get there, but it's it's going to take a little while. I've heard you have to blot rather than rub. Uh, yes, yes, because what what you are trying to do is sort of saturate the area with things that will break down the wine and then draw them back out. Uh, so it takes some of the wine with it, which is why the green machine is really good because it'll inject the the cleaning agent into the carpet fibers and then immediately pull them back out. Again. I am pleasantly surprised at your cleaning knowledge, Rue. Thanks. So if you too have any questions for Agony Aunt Rue, then please send your questions, voice notes or letters to podcast at onepassword.com. You can include your name or let us know if you would like to remain anonymous. So with that, I think we can end our show with our usual shenanigans because love it or hate it, this is our final segment where we like to host our own security theme game. And this is certainly my favourite part of the show where we get to play the Password Panic jingle. So here it is. Password Panic and 
Sir, quick, recall the list and only time will show how the competition in this edition of Password Panic will go. Oh my god, that was so loud. <laughs> That's oh, not quiet. I'm so sorry. Wow. <laughs> That's something else. You just know. <laughs> oh my god, my eyes are watering. That's so loud. Why does it default to putting it at full volume? I don't. Know. <laughs> this is my favorite part of the show where I get to make my ho hosts deaf. My ho hosts. Ho hosts. He's so. <laughs> I can't hear my own voice. <laughs> my ho hosts. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh god okay yeah so welcome to password panic the fast-paced memory testing trivia game mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. our hosts have to answer a number of general knowledge questions to create one long password but there's a catch when answering they must buzz in and recite every correct answer from the round in order before adding the next answer to the list as this long list grows we will begin to create a complex password so this is a test of our knowledge and our memory. So are we ready for the first question? Which planet is known for its rings? Come on, Ray. Saturn. Correct. Next question. What war film directed by Sam Mendes is known for its long takes? Matt. 1917. Mm-mm, Matt, sorry. 1914. You... No, sorry. So, no. Stop. No, stop. The game is that you have to repeat all of the answers up till the point. Oh. Do you remember? know this game, Matt? It, I haven't played this before. <laughs> I've only oh. been host. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Please go continue. Do, try again. Okay. Uh, Saturn, 1917. Very good. Well done. Okay. Next question. What is the name of the test designed to determine if an online user is really a human and not a bot? Go for it, Rhea. Saturn 1917 captcha very good okay next question what is the name of the standard english language computer keyboard go on Ray. saturn 1917 captcha qwerty very good oh. next question which hollywood deadpool actor featured in a one password commercial oh god saturn 1917 captcha qwerty Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Next question. What is the most spoken language in the world? Ding. <laughs> that was a reluctant rue. <laughs> yeah, well, because I'm like... Mm. Oh, my God. Uh, Saturn, 1917, Captcha, QWERTY, Ryan Reynolds, English? No, incorrect. Oh, no. Wow. Matt, do you want to give it a go? Saturn. (laughs) 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 Oh, oh dear. I can't remember what day of week it is, let alone... Tuesday, isn't it? 1917. Yes. Come on, you've got this. No, you're... Oh, God. Capture QWERTY. <laughs> Capture QWERTY. Ryan Reynolds. You can't help each other out. Spanish? No. <laughs> Latin. Okay, you both Latin. failed this round. Latin. Latin. <laughs> you both failed this What is miserably. the most language? The most spoken language in the world is Chinese. Whoa. There you go. That's. I'm so happy to have learned that. Chinese, 1.3 billion native speakers, 900 million of whom speak Mandarin. Spanish is 486 million native speakers, and English is 380. So, Oh, we're out by a long way. Yeah. Have we finished? Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that was the last question. I don't know what the score is, though. I lost. You won. Okay. I don't think anyone won. Nobody won. Okay. No, we all lost. I love you, though. I love you both. Oh, I don't know. Love you both. The shine of our British accents has, uh-huh. has faded, so I don't know if you love me. Yes. I love you both. I love you both. <laughs> okay. Love you, bye. Love you, bye. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. If you're enjoying the show, we'd love it if you could subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also leave us a rating or review. It's one of the best ways to support the Random Memorable Podcast, and we always enjoy reading your feedback. 
We're also a community-led podcast, so if you have any questions for us to answer in Ask One Password, topics, requests, or even guests that you'd like to hear from, please send us a message to podcast at onepassword.com. We read all of your comments and look forward to hearing from you. We hope you join us next episode for plenty more random moments in the world of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity.